Hello, hello, good morning. A few people starting to join. Welcome everybody. Good morning, good morning. Hi Rana. How are you today? We're just getting set up. We'll let everybody get settled in. We'll be starting in about seven or eight minutes. Hi, Diana. Diana, if you change your chat options to all panelists and attendees or um, everyone, depending on your version of Zoom, um, then everyone can see your message because otherwise only I can see it. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Hong Nguyen. Nice to see you. Thailand, Vietnam. Nice. Can see some more familiar names here. Hi, Lady Jane. Good morning, Ever. Hi, Jacinth. Very good. Yeah, we're just getting just getting settled in. Hi, May. Just getting settled in. We'll be starting in five minutes or so. We're just letting everybody get into the room and get themselves sorted. Ronaldo, actually nobody calls me Mr. Tiffany. <laughs> you just call me Andrew, it's fine, like Luciana did. There we go. <laughs> no one calls me Mr. Tiffany. Very good, but yeah, nice to see everybody this morning. I think it's this morning for most people. Uh, it might be afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Probably not afternoon. Bolivia. Hey, Ronaldo. So it must be evening for you. Still on the 10th. Uh, for me here, it's the 11th, which, depending on which part of the world you're from, is either Remembrance Day or Singles Day, um, depending on where you are in the world. Or for the rest of us, it might just be Thursday. <laughs> But nice to see you all. Got about 30 people joining in at the moment. I know we're going to get some more as everything settles in. Hi, Cherry. Very good. So you can see the nice photo we've got on the screen here. You can see the caption at the bottom, actually. Um, but when you first looked at it, what did you think it was? the image that we have on the screen there. What, what did you think of it when you first saw it? If you didn't read the caption and you weren't sure what it was, what did you think it was? <laughs> Hi, Jesus. From the Philippines. Wow, we got people from everywhere. Bolivia, Thailand, Philippines, uh, Vietnam. So some people here from Malaysia and Cambodia as well. Crocodiles are, yeah, not a bad guess, right? Because it looks kind of scaly and it does look like an eye. Um, I was thinking it was something like a dragon's eye. <laughs> but then again, I do role playing games sometimes. So that's why I think dragons. Yeah, it is a, it is a small lake, Kiram. Yeah, you can see it's a, a geothermal pool in Iceland, as it says in the caption at the bottom. So, uh, Interesting, the colors, right? The surrounding is pretty kind of barren brown gray, and then you have this bright kind of green blue pool in the middle there. It's quite interesting. So yeah, it's not actually a volcano per se, but it is like a geothermal uh, pool. So the water's being heated, which is why uh, running off towards the bottom of the screen, you can see some steam there. How are we doing for time? In about five minutes till we get started. I'll probably start housekeeping in about three minutes or so. But uh, nice to see you here today for an interesting lesson on finding happiness, right? We should have a bit of fun with this one today. Just checking the name list to see who's here. Rana, you're here twice. You must be on two devices. Either that or you shared your link with somebody else. Well, that's okay. 
Hi, Christine, how are you? Yeah, quite a few names I recognize here, it's nice. It's good to have you coming back again and again. You're not getting tired of us yet. <laughs> it's a bit cold here today for me, that's why I'm wearing my woolly sweater here. But I kind of need it, it's, it's uh, not, not the warmest in, in the room where I am. <laughs> That's fine, Luciana, we'll look after the recording. We have that there for you later on. Hi, Han, nice to see you in Vietnam. And Li Hui as well, very nice. Yeah, good to, good to see people from all parts of Asia and, and parts elsewhere. Bolivia, as we saw earlier, I know sometimes we get people from other places like Argentina or India, uh, Pakistan, uh, Middle East sometimes, people from all over the place. Some Romania, I saw someone on the registration list from Romania. They're going to join us this morning as well, our morning, their evening. Hello, the Philippines, Noliza, and more Vietnam, Som Chai from Thailand, Johnny from the Philippines. Brian, thanks for uh, <laughs> g'day. Yeah, a cricket fan. Actually, I haven't I haven't been following the cricket that much to be honest. But I'll go check the highlights out later. But thanks for letting me know the result. That's okay. I uh, sometimes use my lunch times to jump on YouTube and see what's going on on the sports highlights. But uh, yeah, it's one way to keep in touch with it, right? Hi, Anna Hongdin, Miko. Hi from Japan. Anna in China. Anna, what part of China are you from? Because it's a big place. Same for everybody, I guess. Which city are you in? We've got a, got a minute or two. You can tell me which city you're in quickly. And we'll get started very soon. Beijing, okay, nice. Must be cold. Must be cold in Beijing at the moment. Yeah, winter coming on. I was in Beijing one winter. Uh, yeah, rather cold, lots of snow. But uh, yeah, yeah, quite cold. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, just a reminder to everybody, um, I'll run through the housekeeping now. Um, and then I'll turn on Facebook Live after I've done that, and then we'll get started, okay? Um, but just the housekeeping, if I can just remind you, um, in your chat settings, uh, almost everyone's done it already, but if you can change your chat options to either everyone or all panelists and attendees, depends if you're on uh, computer or phone or which version of Zoom you're using. But the second of the two options in the drop down box there, that lets you um, communicate with everyone in the chat box. Otherwise, only myself and my uh, National Geographic Learning colleagues can see your messages. OK, so just change it to everyone or all panelists and attendees. OK, uh, and you will see in the menu bar there is a Q&A button as well. So please use that to ask questions as we're going. And it's better to ask questions there rather than in the chat box, because in the chat box, everything disappears pretty quickly. But if you put them in the Q&A box, then I'll be able to um, see them there later on. And I will have some time for some questions at the end of the session. OK, very good. So what I'm going to do is, uh, before we do introductions, actually, let's um, go to here for one second. I'm just going to quickly turn on Facebook Live. If you just give me 30 seconds to get this set up. And once this is going, we will make a start my page there we go okay so that's getting away and running okay almost there it's just loading facebook at the other end okay so very good but anyway thank you everybody for joining us today as we take a look at a lesson in finding happiness uh, which is from a program at National Geographic Learning called LIFT. Um, but before we get into that, just some quick introductions. My name's Andrew, for those of you who don't know me. A lot of you do know me. I know I've seen a lot of your names and uh, before, but I'm a senior academic consultant at National Geographic Learning. Um, I've been a teacher of a lot of different things. Um, English as a foreign language, English language arts, English medium instruction programs, lots of different things, okay? Uh, but I do wanna find out a little bit more about you. And I have two questions for you today in the poll, if you could uh, 
answer the two questions, please. Uh, so let me fire up the poll. Uh, for both of the questions, you can answer as many of the choices as you wish, okay? So on the screen, you should be able to see a poll. And uh, if you teach more than one type of learner, please uh, tick as many boxes as is appropriate, okay? So the first question is what segments do you teach? And then the second one kind of describes, are you an ESL teacher, an EMI teacher, an ELA teacher, international students, bilingual learners? What kind of students do you teach or learners do you teach? Okay. Good morning, Yusi. Good morning, Fujita. Nice to meet you. Indoleka, hi again. Very good. So we've got about 40% of people answered at the moment. I'll, I'll try and we'll try and get to 50 or 60%. Give it another 15 seconds or so. Okay, another five seconds. And that will do it. Okay, so this is good. This gives me a good idea of who's here today. So we got about 60%. Um, if I share the results on screen, sorry, if you're on Facebook Live, you won't see the poll, but that's okay. Um, so most people here are teaching either teens or young learners. So elementary or middle school students, uh, maybe high school students, uh, which is good um, because that matches more with the program we have today. Um, if you're teaching other age groups, some of the ideas I do today may be able to transfer to what you're teaching. OK, um, but the program itself is a teens program today. OK, uh, and then if we look at the second question, most of us seem to be teaching um, EFL or ESL students um, and a few are teaching more international bilingual kind of uh, students as well. So today's uh, lesson, as I will explain shortly, is a little bit more um, about it's, it's a content based English lesson for teens, okay? And so uh, the type of material that we're gonna be looking at today is not what you would normally give to an EFL student, a foreign language student. Um, it's, at a, it's at a significantly more um, uh, rich kind of language context than you would normally give to a, a foreign language student, okay? Um, so just to explain a little bit about the program before we jump in, because I wanna make sure you understand what I'm teaching today. This is This is, a little bit different to other things you might have seen me do before, okay? So this is a content-based English program. Uh, it's designed for young teens, okay? So 13 to 15 years old, maybe grade six, seven, eight, nine, somewhere around that kind of age group, okay? Um, and it does focus quite heavily on academic language, content, and literacy, okay? So we're not really teaching basic vocab and grammar, things like that, we're really getting into literacy, we're really getting into academic vocabulary and academic language, okay? So there's a lot more, uh, if you want to say meat, uh, in this kind of program that you have to digest. And along with that, it's a very large program. Um, it usually takes six or more hours per week to teach this kind of program, um, because there's a lot of material. Um, if you look at the student book and the language companion, the kind of the workbook, that goes along with it. Uh, it's about 65 pages in about four weeks. There's a lot of material and you'll see the depth of material as we get into it. Um, to give you a quick idea, this is the unit uh, that I'm gonna be looking at today. You can see there's a lot of different pieces in this unit uh, and I only have the ability uh, in the short amount of time today to kind of cover pieces of this section here. I can't even touch the rest of it because there's just so much material, okay? Um, but we will be looking uh, today at uh, a story from Leo Tolstoy, okay? We'll be looking at some skills um, to do with allegories, okay? Uh, sorry, allegories, excuse me. I always say that wrong. Um, and we will look at a photo and a video uh, and find out a little bit more about that as well, okay? Great. Okay, so let's take a look uh, at what we're going to be doing. And one other thing I'll say as we go along, I'm going to use uh, some mega cognitive questioning today. Um, because for teenagers, we want to advance their thinking skills a lot more. Um, these are some of the questions I'll refer to today. This is um, a link at the bottom of the page here. I'll post this to you later on. Um, but this is a link to an article which talks about these questions that I saw recently. Um, and I will be using some of these ideas today. So you can see this is not just your regular foreign language English lesson, this is something a bit different, okay? Great, so on that note, I am gonna switch screens to our classroom presentation tool. 
which is hiding somewhere. Where is it? It's uh, here. I need to get off Facebook Live. There we go. I need to be on here. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this material today. So the good thing about today, I think, is for all of you, you can just be yourselves. You don't have to pretend that you're younger learners or foreign language learners. I think for today, you can just be yourself and answer pretty naturally when I'm asking questions, uh, because some of these topics are interesting and quite deep, even for adults. OK, um, so see what you think as we go through. OK. Um, so on the screen, you can see uh, happiness. It says it's some sort of festival. Uh, it says way down on the bottom here, right down in the bottom corner, people are celebrating uh, the happiness at the, is it the Muscata Festival in the Philippines? So people from the Philippines, there you go, one of your festivals. Maybe this is you on the screen, I'm not sure. Um, but it looks pretty colorful, right? It looks pretty interesting. Now there is a quote in the top, uh, right hand corner here, which we will look at, which says, if uh, there can be no happiness, if the things we believe in are different from the things we do. Okay, so how do you feel about that? What do you think about this quote? What, what do you feel about this? Do you agree with this? What do, do you understand what it means? Or are you not sure what it means? There can be no happiness if the things we believe in are different from the things we do. So what, what do you think that might mean? Does anyone have an idea in the chat box? How can we relate to this idea? Okay, so Hale says happiness is in us deep inside our heart. So how does, how does that tie, Hanla, with, with the idea of the things we believe in and the things we do? What, what do you think? about those things. Can you give an example maybe? Can you relate it to something you already know? Okay, so Indalika says doing half-hearted things does not make us happy. Russell says do things that make you happy. Okay, maybe. If we don't do what, believe, what we believe in, we are fake, says Anfam. Okay, and then if we're fake, do we feel happy, right? So um, maybe for example, you work in a job, where you uh, believe it should work a certain way, but your boss tells you to do it a different way. So maybe you believe in talking with your customers and trying to figure out their needs and the boss is instead telling you things like, no, you gotta do it fast, you gotta do it in two minutes, get it finished, get it finished, just move on. And if, if we believe in one thing, but we do something different, would that make us happy? Seems like this, uh, this quote from Freya Stark here is saying not, right? Yeah, so yeah, so I think uh, uh, Nur Fajiri, Fajiri, sorry if I'm saying your name correct, uh, is it says it means being happy can't be fate. That's quite nice, I like that, right? Yeah, so do the things you believe in and you will be happier. And if you're not doing, if you're doing things you don't believe in, things you don't feel strongly about, yeah, if you're forced, as Jesus says, um, then you won't like what's going on, okay? So I guess in this question then, uh, going back to the picture here, uh, do these people look happy? Do you think they believe in what they're doing and they're happy? Or do you think the masks are, are hiding the fakeness that's underneath? What do you think? Do you think they're pretty happy, Kathleen? Yeah, could be, right? What would, because maybe you could look at their body language. What would their body language tell you? Sometimes people say you look at the eyes, right? If you look at the eyes of the people, if we look at the eyes right here, do they look like happy eyes? Or are they faking, right? A mm, little hard to tell, they're in shadow. Okay, a little hard to tell, right? But maybe the hand gestures you're telling you, you know, they're, if they're being energetic, they might, be, they might be more happy as well. The body is open, says Kathleen, yeah. Good, okay, nice. Well, there is a ton of content here, so let's move on. We don't wanna, don't wanna mess around with uh, taking too long on different things. So every unit uh, of a program like Lyft uh, typically has some sort of um, big question, essential question, something we always want to answer. And so the essential question we have in this section is this one, how can we achieve happiness? How can we achieve happiness? So what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at a concept map. Now, I've actually got this on another screen uh, where I can write more easily. So I'm just going to jump to here. Okay, you can see it's the same image. So let's think for a moment. Um, 
let's look at the, the left hand question here. What is happiness? What is what is happiness? If you said, if you had to define happiness, what would you say? What is happiness? Let's write some things down here. Normally in class, you'd be writing, but you, I can't see what you're doing. So I'm going to write here. Doing things you like. OK, so do things you like, then you'll be happy. OK, uh, contentment. OK. Yep, when people are happy around us, so when others are happy, then we are happy, maybe. OK, uh, just feeling good. OK. Mm, fulfilled. OK. Satisfied. OK, it's a state of mind. OK, happiness is a state of mind. So how would we describe that state of mind, I think, is, is the question, right? Do what we love. OK, so do what we like, do what we love. You're grateful. OK, so there's a lot of words here. And the question is, if we've got a word like I am happy, I am fulfilled, I am satisfied, I am grateful, I feel good. Are they all exactly the same? Or are they different a little bit? Yeah, what do you think? So if we say happy, content, fulfilled, satisfied, grateful, are those words the same? Or do they have different meanings somehow? Different, right? Is it easy to describe the difference or not? Is it kind of difficult to describe the difference? So easy to describe the difference or kind of hard? Yeah, kind of difficult, right? Yeah, it's hard to describe because it's a feeling, right? And sometimes feelings are hard to describe, especially the difference between two feelings, right? So if I'm feeling upset and I'm feeling angry, for example, it might be hard to describe the difference, right? If I am content and I am fulfilled, it might be hard to describe the difference as well. Okay, if I'm happy, okay? Cool, right? Yeah. Now, what about the second question here, which goes on to um, what Marianne was just saying, uh, depends on what made you happy, right? So what can we do? How can we find happiness? So I think, how do you find happiness? How do you, how do you make happiness for yourself? If you want to become happy, what do you do? How do we find happiness? What do we think? Shopping, <laughs> I find happiness in shopping, okay? Nice. Uh, spend time with others. Okay. Deli okay. So we've got things about food here. We've got being healthy. Health. I can't spell today. Healthy. Um, someone said don't overthink. So kind of settle your brain, maybe. Ah, oh, I can't write well today. There we go. Uh, you're taking a bath. Okay. You're doing your hobby. You're trekking or, or uh, hiking or something like that. I have a friend who's doing that today. Yep. Spend time with your loved ones. Yep. Cool. Doing good for others. Okay. Uh, so it's doing good. Okay. For others. Nice. So chilling. Nice. Yeah. So lots of different things that can make us happy, but where we can find our happiness. We can find our happy place and our happy activity. Right. So there's a lot of different things that we could do. Uh, and what we're going to do today, this is as we're starting to build up this concept of happiness, um, we'll keep coming back to this, and we would throughout the unit, to say, let's, let's think about this is how we started. But as we go through and we have some more inputs and ideas, maybe we can refine our ideas. Maybe we can get a better definition of happiness, right? So that's what we're going to do as we walk through the unit. So we're going to come back to this one later on, okay? But right now... I'm going to switch screens back to uh, the classroom presentation tool here. OK, uh, and we're going to move on and we're going to look at the next um, page here. I mean, I'm, as you can see, I'm actually jumping over different things here, but I'm going to just kind of move forward. There are some questions and things at the bottom. I want to jump forward, chat boxes in the road, uh, to a vocab activity. So let me open this up. Now, when we do uh, these kinds of activities, let me just, I just want to change my screen like this. There we go. Um, when we do these activities, uh, this is about academic vocabulary. A lot of the time, what we might do 
uh, is we might read a passage with unknown vocabulary and try and figure out what it is. Or other times we might do it as I'm doing now. We might start with the vocabulary and go to the passage later, okay? So I'm doing it a little bit differently to the teacher's guide as the teacher's guide is telling me to do today. Uh, I'm gonna go this way and I'm gonna start, let's just look at the words, okay? So we've got six words here, okay? Uh, the first word is this one here, it's very, okay? And then we've got the other five you can see at the top here. So effect, concept, environment, factor, and survey, okay? Uh, and with my students, if I know my students, I'd probably just say, which of these words do you feel comfortable about? Which of these words do you know, right? Um, uh, you know, let's quickly go through them. So very, show me your hands. Okay, effect, concept, et cetera, et cetera, right? And if you know the word, uh, give, me a, give me a definition, give me a, a, a meaning of that word uh, or put it in a sentence for me so I know that you know what it means, okay? So I often do this to check what my students already know. Okay, what do you know? I don't ask them which words don't you know because usually they won't tell me, okay? So, um, but what we'll do here, let's just do this really, really quickly. Uh, we've got the five words and we've got five spaces down here. Okay, so if we look at the first one here, uh, to, change some, to change someone or something, if we change someone or something, which word is that? Effect, says Jesus. Okay, so let's drop effect in there, okay? Now, if we look at the second word, the second word is concept. Uh, is it number one, number two, number three, or number four that it goes into here? Concept. What do we think concept is? So concept, is it number one, number two, number three, or number four? Number two, okay, Jesus is really quick off the mark today. Okay, so a general idea. Okay, let's make this a little bigger, here we go. Uh, what about the third one here, environment? Is it number one, number two, or number three? One, two, or three, environment, environment. One, two, or three, one. Okay, so we're dropping environment in here. Okay, so that leaves us with a set of questions and something that contributes to a result. So a set of questions is a, a what? Survey, yep, cool, great, which, oh, wrong one, sorry, that should go there. And then that means factor, oh, come here. Is gonna drop at the bottom and then let's just check all the answers and yes, we're good, okay. So often um, I find, uh, depends on my students. Sometimes my students know a lot of these new vocabulary words that are in the unit and we can do this very quickly. Other times they don't know them and we're gonna go through and do um, some sort of activity to help them kind of comprehend the words and figure them out for themselves because that's what we often have to do in literacy and reading is we come across unusual words and we have to decipher their meaning from the context, right? Um, so yeah, so that's one way we can do that kind of activity. Now I've actually got uh, a slightly different way to do the activity. So the basic activity um, would be, here are the words uh, in context, in a passage, what do they mean? I'm gonna do this a little differently. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken the passage, which has these words, I've left the words in there, but I've removed some other words, okay? Um, and from the context, and especially from the blue words, the, the academic vocab words, let's try and figure out what the gaps are that we've got here, okay? So um, all of these passages, even though they're, they're here to teach us or help us with vocabulary, they actually have meaning in them as well. So they do mean something in terms of our topic today. So happiness is a concept that everyone talks about, but people do not always mm on its definition. Okay, so we've got Anna says dwell, we've got agree, we've got rely, agree, okay. Do not always depend on its definition. Okay, good, so what you're doing is you're trying to think about what word would I use here, right? What, what makes sense in terms of the overall passage, right? Um, and if we go down to the next one, surveys of people around the world have shown that mm, about happiness vary from person to mm, and even from country to mm, okay so maybe we can tie some ideas into that one as well but yeah the first one as uh, some of you said is agree so well done there we do not always agree on its definition okay so let's look at the second word surveys of people around the world have shown that mm, about happiness opinions about happiness okay uh, definitions about happiness ideas about happiness Nice, okay, cool, so yes, this one is ideas, well done, but definitions would work as well, yeah, okay. Uh, maybe we wouldn't say definition because we use the same word here in the, in the sentence above, but yeah, ideas about happiness, right? 
Okay. Now this is, these next two are more about, I just want to let my students know about the phrase, uh, kind of the co-location or the phrase that goes here. So ideas vary from person to person. Yeah. Not person to people or person to person to city or something. It's person to person, right? And country to obviously country as well, right? So this, the reason I did that is just because I want my students to maybe work with that less familiar phrase, okay? So that they focus on it a little more. Okay, a factor that is mm, to one's person happiness may not affect someone else's happiness. What word do we think goes there? A factor that is crucial, important. Yeah, crucial is a nice word. It's a very specific word, right? Essential to one's happiness, good, yeah? Good. So yeah, these are all good words, right? Yeah, slightly different meanings. But yeah, the one that's here is important. Okay. But yeah, crucial could work. Uh, essential could work. Yeah, nice. Okay, now next one. Scientists have recently discovered that happiness is, mm, they claim that about 50% of our happiness is genetic and the other 50% comes from our environment. Okay, now, what word could go there? Actually, it's two words. There's actually two words that go there. Yeah. Hereditary, okay. Key factor, nice. Yeah. Okay, could be a few things. Now I'm gonna, there's actually two boxes here. I've hidden one. So I'm gonna take this bit away. It says partly something, partly something. Now, if you think about this for a second, it's partly which like, I, I, I would assume it's either going to be partially genetic or partially or partly, sorry, environmental, right? And But if you think that scientists recently discovered it, which do you think would be the more recent discovery? Yeah, maybe that it's genetic, right? Yeah, so what we can do here, again, is we can draw students' attention to other key words, like the fact that it's recently discovered is, is an important idea that ties in with the sentence, right? Okay, so yeah. So partly genetic, right? Is that interesting to you? Did you know that? 50% of your happiness is genetic, which means you may be genetically predisposed to be happy or to be not happy. I think maybe we know some people who are like that, right? Yeah, okay. So yeah, some people just seem happier. Maybe genetically they're built that way, okay? But yeah, this gives us some interesting ideas we can play with in the idea uh, around these words, but also just the idea of this article itself. Okay, great. So what we're gonna do is let's jump back to our presentation tool here as we're talking about happiness. Just make this a little larger, zoom back out. So you can see there's some other activities on the page here. I'm just skipping those, we don't have time. Um, I've got to go through this fairly quickly today. So much content. But uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on uh, to get ready to read, okay? And what we're gonna read about is we're gonna read a story and the story is called The King and the Shirt. Now, does anyone know this story? Has anyone heard of this story before, The King and the Shirt? It is by an author called Leo Tolstoy, whose name you probably recognize. Okay, so Kirsty, if you know the story, anyone who does know the story, please don't spoil it for others. I'm going to... Um, uh, slowly introduce the story to you. Cherry, it's, that's a good, uh, Cherry, you, you're, you're bringing up a good um, similar story. Um, you're thinking of the emperor's new clothes, okay? That's a different story, okay? About the clothes that are invisible because they're not really there, right? Um, so Cherry, that's a different story. That's not the one we're looking at today, okay? But before we get into the story, um, the story is about what contributes to happiness. Now, I want you to think about these six factors that are on the screen, yeah, these six factors, about how much do these affect your happiness? So free time, friends, family, sleep, money, and exercise, okay? So in the chat box, what I'd like you to do is, I'd like you just to write in the number one. What's the number one thing that affects your happiness, right? Either it makes you happy, or if something's going wrong in that area, it kind of destroys your happiness. So we've got a lot of family here. We've got some free time. Yeah. Family and free time for most people. Friends, okay. Family, family, lots and lots of family here. Yeah. Exercise from Kathleen, good, okay. Makes you feel good about yourself, makes you happy maybe. Releases endorphins into your brain, right? Yeah. Um, 
Cool, free time. Yeah, so a lot of people here seems to be friends, uh, sorry, family, and then maybe friends and free time and then uh, uh, exercise for a few people. Um, a couple of people now saying sleep and fam is saying money, really? Really, Anpan? Is that, is that the number one? <laughs> Depends on your situation, I guess. Okay, good. So we could spend some time talking about these. We could go into more key vocabulary, which is down here. Um, I'll just look at these words really, really quickly. Uh, the highlighted black words there because they do appear in the article. So we've got words like possessed, concoction, okay, got a mixture, right, of different things, right? Um, advisors, summoned, um, handsomely, as used as an adjective, right? Paid handsomely, right? Sorry, as an adverb, excuse me, what am I saying? Um, uh, means as paid, done, something is done very, very well to a very high degree, a large degree, right? And to nourish your body. So you can see these kinds of words we're doing are very academic vocabulary based words, okay? But let's take a look at uh, the story. So before we do that, I want to jump uh, to two things. We're going to take a quick look at the image that's on the screen. Don't worry about the words in the story for the moment, okay? So based on this picture, what you can see in the image, what do you think uh, is, do we know anything about the story from the image that's here? What do we know about the images we can see on the screen here? So you can see quite a lot of things. It's in Russia. So why do you say it's in Russia? Why do you say it's in Russia? Yeah, we can see the king is sick, that's true. Yeah, the castle in the background, it's not actually a castle. This is St. Basil's, uh, or modeled at least, on St. Basil's Cathedral, which is in uh, Red Square in Moscow, right? Yep, so, so this definitely makes it look Russian, okay? Um, what else can we see that tells us something about the story? So the clothing, what do you think of the clothing that's on, uh, on the different people we have here? Wealthy, rich, okay, yeah. Uh, maybe it's in a church? Okay, yeah, could be rich, yeah. Um, the, the person here, is, we guess he's the king, um, he's on a purple pillow. Purple is a color for royalty, right? Typically, um, historically speaking. Um, yeah, we've got potions here of some kind. So is, this is uh, maybe not modern. And I guess we can see the guard with his, with his plate armor and his halberd here as well, or pole axe. Um, definitely doesn't look like a modern story, does it? It looks like an older story. Okay, maybe at least 100, 150 years, something like that. Okay, yeah, so we've got some different images and things we can see here, okay? Now, the other thing we can see, if we go right to the top, uh, we can see this is written by Leo Tolstoy, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is, uh, again, I'm gonna switch screens back to here for a second. Just scroll down a little bit. Here's a little bit of information about Tolstoy, uh, if you don't know. So he was uh, born almost 200 years ago. Um, and passed away a bit over 100 years ago. So a Russian author, considered one of the greatest writers of all time, who wrote realistic novels about Russian society. He also wrote short stories, essays, and plays, okay? So he's written a lot of different types of things here, okay? Uh, and what we're gonna see as we see in, this, in the, what we're reading today um, is he's written an allegory about um, something today. So what is an allegory? I'm gonna jump back. Now that we know a little bit about the story that we're reading, I'm gonna go back a page and we're gonna look at what an allegory is, okay? So an allegory is a story with a message, okay? And it also uses a lot of symbolism, right? It uses a lot of symbols within the story, okay? So one example of that kind of story, just to be really, really brief about this, is the tortoise and the hare, okay? This is an allegory, right? Um, what do what are the symbols within the story? Well, the the tortoise is maybe the kind of person or the kind of uh, organization that works slowly and steadily on something to achieve a result, whereas the hare is more like the person or the organization that's going from one thing to the next very very quickly, changing its mind, doing different things. But who wins in the end? I think we all know the tortoise wins, and maybe the message is that slow and steady eventually wins the race. Okay. So that's an example that you probably know of an allegory, right? Um, uh, sorry, an allegory. Why do I keep saying that wrong? I learned it as allegory when I was a kid and it's kind of stuck, <laughs> an allegory, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go back to other things that you know. Do you know of any other allegories? Do you know of any other stories 
or novels or anything like that that are allegories? Do you know of any? In the chat box, do you know of any? Any stories or ideas you know that are allegoric? Or the fox and the hen, yep, okay. Could be, for, so, for those, I'm not gonna explain all the stories if you don't know them, it will take too long. Okay, any others? Fox and the hen is a good one. Grasshopper and the ants, yeah, that's a really good one if you know that one. The boy who cried wolf, could be, yeah, sure. These, these stories all have messages and they have symbols as well within them. Um, town mouse and country mouse, sure, yeah. Yeah, fables and, and just generally Aesop's fables have a lot of um, um, allegories inside them. They're, they're very allegoric, right? Animal Farm, yeah, Russell, exactly, right? Um, that is probably one of the classic allegoric novels, right, is Animal Farm. If anyone knows Animal Farm, uh, George Orwell, uh, it's commentary basically on communism, um, but not recognizable because it's all about animals living on a farm <laughs> and doing things on the farm, right? Um, yeah, so, so lots of different um, symbols and images and meanings that come out of these different stories as we go, okay? So this is what we're looking at today. And what we're going to do today is we're going to read uh, The King in the Shirt and we're going to analyze it as, uh, after we're done, okay? So I'm gonna jump back up here. Let me zoom in because I don't want you to see the whole thing to start. I want, only want you to see the first half, okay? Now I'm gonna read it really quickly just to help us along, but you can read it yourself, obviously. Uh, but many years ago in a land very far away, a mighty king suddenly became weak with illness. He could not command the royal army from his golden throne. He could not ride his graceful black stallion. He could barely even raise his head from his purple and satin pillow. The royal physician tried every medicine he possessed, potions, pills, and poultices, but the king's health did not improve. The royal magician tried every cure he could conjure up, charms, chants, and concoctions, but the king did not get well. The royal advisors whispered among themselves at the king's bedside, what's to be done? We must have a cure for the king is the next word. Okay, okay. so if we look at this at the moment, this story is called The King in the Shirt. Have we seen anything about a shirt yet in here? We've got a king, right? Uh, so what's going on here? What's the, what's the challenge, the problem? What is the the crisis that's going on in the story. What's the crisis that's going on in the story? So the king is sick, right? The king is ill, okay? And we're trying to figure out how to make him better, okay? Now, uh, there are some different images or symbols that are in here that we could look at. Maybe we don't understand the meaning yet, but do you think we can identify any symbols that are in here at the moment? Any things that might be symbolic? any things that might be symbolic in the story. Let's see if you can, if we can guess any, or we can, uh, we do, maybe we don't know the meaning, okay? Black Stallion, the charms, yeah, the charms, chants, and concoctions, yeah. The Black Stallion could be a symbol, true. Yeah, any others? Satin Pillar, maybe, Golden Throne, sure. Yep, Raising His Hand, yeah. Okay, that gives you a symbol that he's, that he's weak at least, right? Yeah, okay. So we've got some different things that could be symbols, but we're not really sure how they tie together with the story yet, right? We don't really have the message. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at the next piece. We'll go over to here. Um, let's do this piece here. Okay, so uh, we must have a cure for the king, they said. Then for a long time, they stood and thought in silence. Finally, the youngest of the advisors, the short one whose wispy golden curls escaped from under his tall advisor's hat, stepped forward. He spoke in a strong, bold voice that echoed off the marble walls of the king's bedchamber. We must find a happy man, take his shirt and put it on the king. Then the king will be well again. His royal highness slowly turned his aching head in the direction of the young man's voice. With eyes fogged with fever, he struggled to see who had spoken the promise of a cure. So be it, he whispered. Then he fell into a restless sleep. The king's most trusted advisor, the gray-bearded one, whose wide belly struggled to say inside his long scarlet robe, summoned the royal messengers. Search the kingdom for a happy man, he ordered. When you find one, take his shirt and bring it back to the royal castle. Tell the happy man that he will be handsomely rewarded for his trouble. Okay, so we've got some more. We've, we've got a shirt now. We know what's going on with a shirt. 
there is a shirt uh, appearing in the story. So we have to find a happy man and take his shirt. So any other uh, possible symbols in here that we might come back to later? Any symbols that you can see or that we might, might want to refer back to later? What do you think? The shirt, sure. Yep. Any others? The happy man, yeah. The happy man could be a symbol, sure. Okay. What about the advisors? Do you think the advisors might be symbols? We've got a, a young advisor and an old advisor. Yeah, the, the short one and, the, and the, the other one who seems very fat, apparently. Okay, they could be, right? Okay, we'll find out about those soon. Okay, we've got half a page to go, so let's read the rest of the story. Here we go, down the bottom. Uh, oh, excuse me, I have trouble with that sometimes. Okay, the royal messengers traveled far, they traveled wide. They traveled throughout the kingdom from one end to the other, from side to side. But try as they might, they could not find a truly happy man. No one was ever completely satisfied with his lot in life. If he was rich, he argued with his wife. If his marriage was joyful, his children caused him no end of worry. It was one thing or it was another. No one was without complaint. Over many days, the king's health did not change. Concerned for his father, his royal son, the one who had been running the kingdom during his father's illness, decided to join the search. He hadn't traveled far from the castle when he passed a tiny hut. From inside the house of sticks, he heard a clear voice say, I am truly blessed. I have completed my work. I have nourished my body. Now I can relax and enjoy the quiet at the end of the day. What more could anyone require? Excited, the royal son thought, I must go inside and take this man's shirt for the king. As he prepared to knock on the door of the humble cottage, he fingered the sack of gold pieces at his side. For his generous gift, this happy man would be richly rewarded. Mm. I think we found a happy man. As the door opened, the king's son could only stand and stare. This happy man, the only happy man in the entire kingdom, had almost nothing he could call his own, not even a shirt. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. What do you think about this one? Is it an interesting story? Kirsty's seen this story before. A few other people have seen now. Well, now you know the story. Okay. So interesting, right? So we could talk about summarizing the story. We could talk about what things are going on in here. Um, but what we want to do, because again, because we don't have a lot of time, what we want to do is we want to think about uh, what are some of the symbols that are in this story and what's the meaning that's in this story overall, right? Okay, so Kathleen's saying happiness is not in possession, okay? Could be, that could be the meaning of the entire story, right? Could be, okay? So there's a lot of different things we can pull out of this. Um, and for the sake of time, we're gonna jump through a little bit. So here there are some questions and on the next page, there's a lot of different things we could do with close reading and multiple meaning words and things like that. But I just wanna focus on this section here because you're adults and you've done this a little bit before, I'm sure. And we can, we can work on it as a group, that's fine. We're gonna look at this activity and I've set it up on the other screen where I can write more easily. So under Leo Tolstoy here, I've got um, the Allegri analysis, allegory, sorry, analysis. <laughs> I keep doing that. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. So we've got an example here. It says we've got the symbol of the king. Uh, what happens to the symbol? Well, the king is sick and they're looking for a cure. And the symbolic meaning is the king is feeling unhappy in life, but wanting to feel better. Okay. So the king is feeling unhappy because the king cannot do the normal kingly things that a king does. Cannot command the army, cannot ride the black stallion, things like that, right? Can't do any of the kingly things, not happy, wants to get better, okay? So that's the symbolic meaning of that. Okay, now what about this one here? The search for a happy man's shirt. So what actually happens in the story? So they look, uh, for example, but, but what? They look, but, maybe we can say, um, yeah, they, uh, but uh, many people are not happy. Well, most people are not happy, right? 
Okay, it's hard to find something, right? Yes. Yeah. So the symbolic meaning, searching for something that probably doesn't exist, or even just the fact that we're searching for something that's difficult to find, right? Okay, it's, or maybe it's not difficult to find, maybe it's just difficult to recognize, maybe it's difficult to identify, okay? And that could be the symbolic meaning, right? It's hard to identify what happiness really is, maybe. The definition of happiness eludes us, okay? Okay, now what about the next one? The man without a shirt. What does the man without, what happens to that symbol in the story? Well, so I think quickly we can say he's found, um, and we hear what he has to say, we hear him, okay? Um, but he's maybe not what we expect. Um, we don't expect what we find out about this person, okay? So what would the symbolic meaning be here? Okay, yeah, so maybe Angelina, that could be a good one, realization of the truth, right? That could be um, an allegory that, or a meaning that we could pull out of this, right? OK, um, also, it could just be the fact that he's a he's a, a basically a possessionless person. Possesh, I can't spell possession. Uh, a possessionless um, yeah, person. OK. Yeah, maybe maybe we're saying, yeah, the, the man without the shirt represents intrinsic happiness, as Brian says. Yeah, intrinsic happiness. Right? Good. OK, so what about some other symbols? Let's look at. So here it says your idea. What are some other symbols that we identified? Um, within the within the story as we were going along. Okay, so I actually I have a bit of a list that we can talk about, but let's see what what ones you identify first. What symbols did we have in there? Okay, uh, so so yeah, just the journey of trying to find the happy man. Maybe it's uh, as you said, maybe the symbol is a spiritual journey, right? And that's the uh, okay. Um, so the journey in here is, is they said they were going far and wide. Okay, they were doing a lot of exploring for that, right? Okay, the advisors, yeah. Okay, so basically two were mentioned. So there was the old advisor and there's the young advisor. Okay, uh, one is old and fat, the other one is young and short. Okay, short. Um, what do they represent? What's their symbolic meaning? What's their symbolic meaning? So yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe that could be right. So um, as Anna says, maybe it's an old way of thinking and this is a new way of thinking, okay? Or a new understanding about something, right? Like a traditional view and a, and a more modern view, perhaps, right? Yeah, good. Um, what about another one? I'm gonna throw one in here. What about the gold coins? What was, so they were uh, supposed to be a reward in the story, but what's the symbolic meaning of the gold coins, do you think? What's the symbolic meaning of the gold coins within the story? Any thoughts? Yeah, so Kirsty, maybe, maybe it's the idea that we can't buy, it is wealth, right? But we can't buy our way to happiness. Okay? Maybe it's, yeah, money can't buy happiness. Maybe that's what the symbolic representation is, right? So there's a lot of different things we can help our students understand by going through these different symbols and seeing how they tie to the message of the story. So what is the message within the story? If we had to have an overarching message to the story, what do you think it might be? Money doesn't buy happiness is a little specific, maybe, right? But what about, we've, we've had some other ideas. We had things like happiness is intrinsic, um, what else? Happiness is inside. Okay, so happiness is internal. Maybe, right? Um, comes from within. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's, um, as you say here, for you to, maybe it's like an open, having an open heart. Um, Wealth isn't always the source of happiness. Yeah, usually um, allegories would be, they wouldn't say what something isn't. They would usually say what something is, right? Yeah. Yeah, find your own happiness. So yeah, so this man has no possessions, but as Anne says, and Fam says, you know, he's he's got happiness in his own way from the things around him and the way he feels, right? Yeah, so um, it's, it's find your own happiness. Could be... Uh, one way of looking at health as happiness, yeah, true. Okay, because we've got the unhealthy king and the 
the, the healthy man who's nourished and rested, right? Yeah, it could be other things. It's like happiness could be found in unexpected things. Happening to, happiness doesn't come from possessions. Um, another one in the story maybe is all of the other people who had, they had some things, but they didn't have other things, but they chose to focus on the things they didn't have. The shirtless man was focusing on the things that he had. He had his health. He had nourishment. He had contentment from a job well done. He didn't have a nice house. He didn't have a shirt, but he wasn't focusing on those things. So maybe happiness is found in the things we have, not the things we don't have. Maybe, right? Appreciating what we do have. So yeah, so there's a lot of ideas we can pull out of this and a lot of messages we can do. And our, our students can discuss this. And this is where a lot of the lesson time can go is when we're discussing ideas and, and trying to form our viewpoints about this, right? Yeah, looking on the positive side of life, Kathleen, that could be true. Nice. Okay, good. So that uh, kind of very, very briefly um, kind of goes over uh, what we do for the man in his shirt, right? But I wanted to look at one more thing um, as we go through here. You can see there's more pieces here, but I wanted to, and to skip over some of the other activities for time, I want to go to this one. I've got a photo here. So in this photo, I'll just make it slightly larger because um, the top and the bottom doesn't really matter too much. Um, what do you see in the photo? What's, what's in the photo here? What do we have here? It's a real person in a real place. There's definitely a story behind this photo. So we see a dog, yeah. Does it look like a dog type or breed that you would recognize? We've got a girl, yeah. Teepees, yeah, we got some sort of teepee or tent or something like that there. She's playing a princess, okay. She's dressed up as a princess. Yeah. What else do we notice here? She's Native American, maybe. Yeah. Could be Native American or First Peoples in Canada, perhaps. Yeah. Um, if we look in the background here, if we zoom in on the background, um, what do we notice about the setting here? What do we see in the, in the background here? So we've definitely got the teepees, the tents. Poverty, maybe. It's a community, yeah, I'm sure there's a, there's a number of people here. Yeah. Tents, yeah. What, what about this here? Like I'm circling something with my mouse, if you can see where my mouse is moving. What's that? A sled, right? So what does that tell you? If that's a sled, what does that tell you? Cold weather, right? Yeah, so while it's grass and green at the moment, maybe this place has a lot of snow and they've just parked there parked their um, sleds up here um, during the warmer weather, potentially, right? Okay, now if we look at the girl, so um, obviously this is, it looks like it's a made kind of cardboard crown or plastic crown, it looks like it's been colored in or something. She's wearing um, kind of a cape or something here. What does that look like? What does the cape look like? And what sort of clothes is she wearing? Looks like a curtain. Yeah, it does look a bit like a curtain, doesn't it? Yeah, she's got boots, yeah. And if you think about the boots, those are like rubber boots. And in the background, we've got teepees. Now, um, people who live in teepees generally don't make rubber, um, which comes from other parts of the world. So um, those are obviously bought. Uh, she is kind of dressed up. Her, she's got a nice dress on by the looks of it. Okay, well, let's, what do you think this photo is about? What, what do you think is going on here? Let's, let's, so maybe Inuit, maybe, yeah. Cool. Happy girl with a dog. You think she's happy? Why do you think she's happy? What's she happy about? She's not really smiling, is she? She looks maybe sleepy. Or does she look content? I'm not sure. Yeah. Got an expression here. Yeah. Okay. So if she's content or if she's happy, why do you think so? Why do you think so? She looks satisfied, yeah, calm. Happy pretending to be a princess. Enjoying a freedom among nature, nice, that could be a good one. Just maybe, at, oh, beautiful me, nice, yeah. Feeling the warm sun on her face, good, nice. She has clothes to wear, maybe that's why she's happy, yeah. Yeah, it's a costume, she's proud of her identity. Nice, you've got a lot of different things here that we think this could be the reason why, right? Could be the reason why, she's within her element. She's dreaming, yeah, nice, lots of things. Okay, now actually what we can do is we can actually find out about this photo because we actually have a video from the photographer who's down the bottom here. 
Evgenia. Uh, so we're going to watch a little video um, where Evgeny explains this photo in a little more detail to us. Okay, now the video may be a little jerky, but the audio should be okay. Let me just check I'm sharing sound. I am. Okay, here we go. Take a listen and see what she says. My name is Evgenia Arbogaeva and I'm a National Geographic photographer. I took this photograph on Yamal Peninsula in the Russian Arctic. Here you see Christina, she is eight years old. Her parents are reindeer herders and they've been living traditional lifestyle like their ancestors for millennia. When children reach school age, they go to school in the village. So the separation is very hard for, both for parents for, and for children. But when the summer comes and children return to the nomadic camp for summer holidays, Christina says that this is the happiest time of her life. I took this portrait in the evening when there was this beautiful soft golden light and Christina is wearing a cape she made of uh, old curtain and um, crown she cut out from the cardboard. And when she was posing for this portrait, she said she's a princess of tundra. <laughs> and when I'm looking now at this photo, I do see this fierce, brave girl who is definitely the princess of this beautiful place, Arctic tundra. Very nice. Good. So we were right about the curtain. Uh, we, were, we were close about the place, right? So she's uh, in the Russian Arctic, um, the reindeer herders. Yeah. And um, yeah, so she's, why was she happy? Do you, did you pick up the reason why she feels happy? Why is she happy in this, in this place? She's come home. Yeah. Home during the holidays. She's with her family. Yep. Yep. She's with her parents, reunited with her family and also reunited with her, where she was born, right? She's probably born here in the teepee, right? Um, in the, in the tent on the tundra. Um, maybe not during winter time, but uh, she was born in this kind of place, right? She would have lived here for five or six years before she started going to school, I guess, right? Um, maybe she's also happy because it's school holidays and she doesn't have any homework. <laughs> it could be another reason, right? Yeah, and she's got her dog. Yeah, her dog. There's probably the family dog. It probably is not in the village with her at school. Yeah, so there's lots of different reasons to be happy right here. Um, you know, that, that she has to appreciate for what... Uh, you know, what's going on in her life at the moment, right? And we could spend a lot of time reflecting about this from our own viewpoint, um, sharing our own photos of where we're happy and thinking about our own ideas. But this gives you some ideas of how we try and tap into these different themes of happiness and help our students talk about this idea, define the idea of happiness, and then kind of bring it all back together, right? So as I said at the beginning, what we might do as we go through the unit, let's go back to here and go back to where we started, and say, so at the end of the day, what is happiness? And how can we find our happiness? Are there any things we feel like we need to take off our list now? Um, are there any things that we should add to our list, right? Uh, of where we find happiness? So maybe we come back to a point and we say, well, let's talk about shopping, right? Is it, is it the buying of the things that makes you happy? Or is it just the being out and about maybe with some friends and seeing some different sights and sounds when you're shopping is that what makes you happy, right? Um, you know, is it the buying or is it the doing, right? That makes you happy. And so maybe we can refine our views a little bit more, right? Yeah, and maybe we can say, how do we find happiness as, as Anne just said, maybe it's from simple things, right? Um, and as we learned in uh, The King in the Shirt, maybe it's the simple things that we have that make us happy. The simple things that we have that make us happy. Okay, nice. Now I've got one more point that I would finish off on with this, um, which we can, maybe we can squeeze in the, in the middle here at the bottom. Um, I want you to think for yourself, okay, this is a learning for you as well, a little bit perhaps. So maybe today we've talked about things that we have and the happiness that we get from the things we have, but maybe there are some things that we have that we don't really need to be happy, right? So down here, what I want us to do is I want us to think about something in my life, what's something that I have that if I didn't have it, I would still be happy because maybe it doesn't actually contribute to my happiness, even though I have it, right? So for example, 
I play computer games sometimes. And if, you, if you're a gamer yourself, you probably know about Steam. It's a service for providing games. So I have a Steam account, okay? Um, and I can use my credit card to buy games and things. But if I didn't have my Steam account, would I still be happy? And I think I would if I didn't have my Steam account. It's something I have now, but if I lost it, I didn't have it anymore, would I still be happy? And I think, yeah, I'd still be happy. So maybe this is something I don't need anymore, right? Maybe I could remove that and still be happy. Okay, so what are some things you have that if you didn't have them, you would still be happy? Now, Hala just said boyfriend. Now, I'm not sure. <laughs> are you suggesting, Hala, that if you didn't have your boyfriend, you would still be happy? I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to pop that one in there. Okay, someone's saying their social media account, right? Okay, if you didn't have your social media account, you would still be happy. I used to use a particular social media account. I have not used it in six or seven years. I am still happy. I agree with that. Cutlery. Someone has too much cutlery in their house. They can get rid of that. Your hair. Your hair or your hairstyle. I don't have hair. I'm still happy. <laughs> I revel in my boldness. <laughs> TikTok, yeah, if you didn't have your TikTok, would you still be happy? Okay, if you, you have a, a maid or a housekeeper or a butler or someone like that, um, you have one of those, but if you didn't, you would still be happy. Cosmetics, right? Okay, if you didn't have that, you'd still be happy. Korean drama. <laughs> Korean dramas, yeah, if Korea stopped making dramas, we would still be happy, right? <laughs> Good, but it's worth thinking about, right? What are the things that we don't really need? We could get rid of and we'd still be happy, right? Because do all of these things really matter to our happiness, right? Okay, good. So I hope you found that interesting today. Um, as we've talked about happiness, uh, I've gone over a few of these ideas, not everything, um, but we talked a little bit about maybe things that are new. What do I recognize? What stands out in something? What do I already know? As we're discussing this idea of finding happiness. Um, and I hope this has given you some ideas um, of this program, things to think about with your students and ways to talk to them about different ideas, maybe something for yourself as well, okay? Because I think happiness is a human thing that we all need to, to have to, to live good productive lives, right? Nice, okay. So we're on the hour. So let's wrap this up really quickly. Uh, just to let you know, follow up from today, uh, we will send out a recording link uh, and a certificate in an email tomorrow. I will also drop uh, the certificate in the chat box for you right now. I just have to find it. There it is. And I can't drop it in like that. Why can't I do that? Oh, I can. Yes, I can. There we go. Sophia's just dropped it in as well. She's put it in as a link. I've put it in as a download. Okay. Um, so do, do grab the certificate now if you want, but it will come to you tomorrow uh, in uh, an email that we will send to you. Uh, we have your email from registration, right? So we can send those uh, to you later. Um, do check out uh, some of our other webinars that are going on as well. We've got more webinars coming up. Um, uh, next week, uh, we have John Hughes, who's one of our um, well-recognized, very popular author. He does a lot of speaking around the world uh, at conferences and things like that. And he's gonna be talking about developing confident communicators. Um, it will be targeted a little bit more at university, kind of older teenagers, young adults, that kind of audience. Um, but uh, I think no matter what age group you're teaching, you will be able to find some benefit there. Um, I'm doing another webinar about money next week. Um, so while today we talked about happiness, next week we're going to talk about money. Uh, and then Kitty's uh, back to talk about um, some things to do with young learner programs, teaching grammar uh, in a couple of weeks as well. Okay. Great, so do check out our webinars page. I dropped the link in the chat box, but I'll just post it in again now. There it is right there. Uh, and you can always sign up for our webinars there, okay? Great, and last thing I will do is I will uh, put a link in the chat box and it will be in the follow-up email as well. If you would like to speak to someone on our team in your local area um, about um, this program that we showed you today, Lyft, about anything we do at National Geographic Learning, if you wanna find out more about how you can get um, resources for your classroom, things like that. Uh, let me drop that link in the chat box as well. Um, and if I find the link, here it is. And if you 
Use this link. It takes you to a form. Now, only fill this form in if you want to be contacted by someone from National Geographic Learning. Okay. It asks you to leave your, your contact email, phone number, um, where you're working, a little bit more information like that. Okay. But please um, only do this one if you want to be contacted by somebody um, or if you have some questions that you want to follow up with. Okay. Great. So I hope that's been useful today. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions. I know some people have to go, but I have time. I can stay and answer questions um, if there are questions that you want to know. Great. And nice one. Thanks, Joan. Thanks, Angelina. Thanks, everybody. I hope it's been interesting. It is a bit of a different kind of lesson to some other ones uh, you might have seen us do in the past, I know. Okay. Great. So in the questions, it seems like at the moment, we don't have questions. Who has a question? Any question is okay. Thank you, everybody. It's always nice sharing with, with you guys because you uh, you always seem to enjoy it. Thanks, Yumiko. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> good, luck, good luck with New Zealand. Oh, we got in the final, Brian. Okay, good job. Well done. <laughs> well done, the Kiwis, the, the black caps. Very nice. Good one. Any questions? Amna, did you have a question? I see you raised your hand. Did you have a question? You can type it in the chat box or you can put it in Q&A. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so Arles says, I love your energy when delivering your talk. Can you share your tips? Well, do you think I'm happy? <laughs> but do you think I have everything I want in my life, right? Um, I think if you want to know why... Um, why do I have energy when I talk? I'm actually a little bit tired today because I was at the gym earlier and, and the gym was treating me harshly. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I just, I just, I really like doing this kind of work, I guess. And so that makes me happy, right? And I like to do it. So it gives me more energy when I do do it. It gives me adrenaline, right? Yeah, lots of things like that. Sorry, I saw a question in the chat box. Uh, what follow-up activities can be used for the lesson? So Angelina, um, one thing you could do, actually, I'll put another link in the chat box, Angelina which is if you go to the page about this program, Lyft, um, which I've just dropped in the chat box, um, you can see, and I will put this in the email as well, um, you can see example units. You can see all of the activities in the unit. There are tons of activities. There's um, conversational activities. There's doing mind maps, word clouds, things like that, where we can explore different ideas around happiness or possessions or what creates happiness, things like this. Um, writing and project activities, um, lots of discussion about the types of words we would use, right? So getting into that academic vocabulary, being more precise about how we, we share our ideas. So many different activities that are in there that I couldn't even look at today, okay? But if you go to that um, site that I dropped in the chat box, eltngl.com slash lift, okay? Then uh, you can look at the sample units um, from this program and it will give you some ideas of the range of activities. Uh, that can go with something like this, okay? So feel free to go check that out. Um, have, a, have a look and see what you can pull out of that, okay? Very cool. Thank you, Kathleen. I try to have passion and energy. I just like my, I, I just, I mean, for you, do you like your jobs? Do you like doing what you're doing? <laughs> because that, uh, that creates happiness, right? Yep. Um, I once had a friend who said her husband is a lawyer, and I, I just randomly said, oh, does he like his job? She said, no, he hates it. And my instant response is, so why is he still doing it, right? And, and her response is pretty typical. He feels trapped in the educational and career path that he's on, and he feels like he can't do something different because he'll lose money, or he, he won't have respect of other people, or something like that. But are those things worth sacrificing for your lack of happiness? Hmm. Worth thinking about, right? But yeah, I, I love what I do, right? I've done jobs that I didn't like, and so I changed them. I did something different, right? So yeah, maybe that's why I am the way I am. Um, Anna, yeah, this program is only in American English at the moment, although to be honest, these days, my personal opinion, right? The difference between American and English and British English is very blurred these days, there's not really just American and British English anymore. The world is full of Englishes now, right? Because there are so many people using English and not everybody uses it in a grammatically correct way. Not even first language speakers use it in a grammatically correct way. 
or with the same accent or with the same understanding of, of basic vocabulary sometimes. Um, English is, is becoming a global language um, and there are a lot of different ways that we communicate with it. It's, so while this is an American English book, it's, it's written with that kind of spelling and so on. Uh, I personally, I don't think it matters too much these days, right? Yeah, spelling, some phrasing, right? Things like um, uh, going to the store, going to the shop, right? There's things like that, right? Um, you know, there's different different phrases or things that might pop up, but generally speaking, yeah, it's it's fairly uh, English is becoming much more universal, more widely understood. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, Honey asks a question: Do you think you can use the Lift series for school curricula? Yes, you can. Um, this kind of program, because of the the depth of the content, as well as the number of language hours or teaching hours, to really get the benefit out of that content, it fits really well for. Uh, maybe an international school program, bilingual school program. Uh, if you're in a, an after school, uh, like a cram school or something like that, this one would be the kind of one you'd want to be doing three or four days a week for two hours at a time. Um, but it does fit very well with achieving those academic goals that, um, you know, uh, an international school or bilingual school, um, you know, uh, English primarily English um, instruction learners learning in, in a school system, it would work really well for that kind of thing. And it has language support uh, to help those people who are not really quite there on their English level yet. It has that language support to help them through as well um, with lots of specific activities and things too. So Hani, yeah, I think it would, um, it would fit pretty well for an international school program, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, a um, couple of others here. Uh, Okay, <laughs> anonymous attendee, you kept speaking full time yet fast without making a class feel bored. Uh, is there another example of a quick, short energizer for online class to get them alive, especially for primary students? Okay, um, so anonymous attendee, um, when I'm teaching primary school age students, um, I slow down a lot more. <laughs> um, I know you're adults, right? So, so I know you can handle my pace a little bit more, but I do slow down a little bit. I use a lot more repetition. Uh, but I also use my voice. I use a lot of intonation, right? And let's go, and okay, let's go. And, you know, and I, I move my voice around a lot, but I also use my body a lot more, even online. And I ask my students to do the same, right? So um, if we're talking about a concoction was one of our words today. If I was teaching that to elementary school kids, I'd be like, you know, it's a concoction. You're putting things together, right? And the visual um, interactivity like that. And also ask my kids to, Maybe when you hear the word concoction, do this like you're making a concoction. These are some different ways to energize your students or to keep them paying attention. Um, you can do a lot of different things like that as well, okay? Um, but come and check out Kitty's session a week and a half from now, two weeks from now, um, because she'll be able to give you a lot of good um, things for teaching. Uh, she's focusing on teaching grammar, but she'll have a lot of primary student kind of activities um, and things online there as well, okay? Good one. Just checking the chat box. Good, I'm just seeing, because there is one more question, but I'm just quickly checking the chat box as well. Reading circles, yeah, I like those too, Kathleen. Reading circles are great. I love to make things more student-centered, right? Learner-centered by putting people in little groups. Those are really good too. Okay, Anne says, um, my students in Vietnam, my students are not as active as those in the class today. True, that, that's, I've had plenty of that as well. They do not like to read, leading to their lack of knowledge, and so they cannot share ideas in class. Can you suggest ideas to motivate them to read? I, <laughs> when, when you're motivating people, right? Go back to the big picture of motivation, psychology for a minute, right? Motivation is either going to be internal or it's going to be external. It's coming from the outside, right? Um, your kids, those, those students you're describing, sound like those kids who lack internal motivation, right? And internal motivation is hard to activate sometimes, right? I know that as well. Um, and if my students don't have internal motivation, I pile on a lot of external motivation. And so I do that with things like points or little silly little rewards like stickers and stamps or giving high fives in class or going over the top with social praise, and verbal praise. Or if my students are shy, it might be that very individual quiet 
kind of praise as well. But I will give a lot of external motivation to motivate my students to do something that I want. And I can literally, with my younger learner students, I can literally get them to do things like sweep the classroom for me because I'm going to externally motivate them with, with something, right? Um, the trick is to find out what they want. Um, I've had students who are 12 and 15 years old and they still want stickers, right, as their external motivation. I've had much younger students who don't like stickers and they do want points that maybe they can apply to scores on their tests. So earn enough points, I'll give you plus two on your next test. Or earn enough points and I reduce your homework by 10% or something like this, right? So I use a lot of those external motivators to, to get the kids going. But then if you're careful, what you can do is over time, you can slowly take those away and the students are in the habit of doing something and through a habit they start building internal motivation right uh, it's tricky it takes time um, but it is something you can try uh, there's a lot of I, i'm not an expert on psychology um, but um, these are tips i've picked up from other people you can go exploring on the internet and find a lot of people who can share a lot of good things about it um, i will say one thing right now what i've just shared some people disagree with those ideas i've just shared because it's a very behavioristic, behaviorism-based approach, and some people don't like that. Um, they have their reasons, I have mine. We can be different, that's okay, right? Um, but uh, yeah, at some stage, the motivation does have to become a bit more intrinsic, right? Um, so uh, yeah, have a think about that, see what you can do with it. Um, look around, get your own ideas, right? Um, but that's how to some ways to motivate students, okay? Um, so I hope that gives you some, some ideas. Okay, cool. Good one. Yeah, but like I say though, don't just listen to me. Um, go out, talk to other teachers, um, find, go and watch what other teachers do. I always found watching other teachers to be really valuable. Every teacher I've watched, I've been teaching more than 20 years, you can tell. Um, every teacher I watch, even if they're brand new to teaching, every time I watch someone, I either see something I like and I want to steal, or I see sometimes, honestly, I see something that goes wrong and it reminds me, ah, yes, don't do that, right? It reminds me not to do something in the future. I always learn. Um, I learn, yes, I learn the good and the bad, right? But I learn what to do myself. And sometimes I remember, oh, yes, remember not to do that. Don't fall into that trap, right? So every teacher you watch can give you some ideas like that. Okay. And I will say, I've picked up more good ideas from even new teachers than I have ideas to avoid, if you know what I mean. Okay. Great. Okay. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? We've still got a hundred and something people here. I must be interesting. You're still here. <laughs> cool. We're pretty happy. Chat box seems to have stopped. No more questions in Q&A. I think we're good. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I hope it's been fun. Hope you've enjoyed your morning. I hope you're happier now than when we started and you've got some things to think about for your own happiness in the future. And if we've done that, as well as taught you how to teach some stuff and, and shown you a, a new National Geographic Learning Program, we're all good, right? Very good, everybody. Well, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, be happy, and we'll see you again real soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>